welcome to the Farm Bits Podcast, a product of Nebraska Extension Digital Agriculture. I'm Jackson Stansel. And I'm Samantha Teton. And we come to you each week to discuss the trends, the realities, and the value of digital agriculture. Through interviews and panels with experts, producers, and innovators from all sectors of digital technology, we hope that you step away from each episode with new practical knowledge of digital agriculture technology. Welcome back to the Farm Bits podcast for the first episode in our planting technology series. It's been a while since we did a farmer focus episode, and it's something we've been looking forward to doing since our harvest series. We wanted to lead this series off with a farmer's perspective to provide a well rounded understanding of the complexity of planting operations. Our guest for this episode is Don Beatty. Don Beatty farms with his wife, Barb, near Lexington, Nebraska, and operates a primarily irrigated operation focusing on corn and soybeans. As an avid participant in the Nebraska On-Farm Research Network, Don has experimented with several planting technologies and seed management practices in an effort to continually improve his operation. In this episode, we will get into the results that he has seen from those experiments, as well as his perspectives on planting, the challenges that he faces, and the things that he's most excited about in the future of ag. With that said, here's our interview with Don Beatty. Do you mind if we start off by having you tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your operation? Sure. Um, We farm in Dawson County, north of Lexington, and uh, um, lucky enough to be um, on the farm that my great-grandparents homesteaded in the 1870s. So uh, we've had it in the family a long time, and as well as we farm, you know, more ground now than they did. Typically, uh, corn soybean, irrigated corn soybean farmer. Um, in the past, we had a small feedlot, but we got out of that about 20 years ago, mm-hmm. um, as partially as me taking over from my dad's operation. We got out of the livestock and increased our crops. Cool. So we're, we're kind of getting into uh, planting in this particular series. And so uh, we were hoping to talk to you a little bit about that part of your operation today. And I guess to kick Mm -hmm. that off, what are some of your biggest priorities when you get into planting season and, and, you know, how does setting these priorities help you to achieve what you want to on your farm? Well, the, the the planner is, I mean, that if you screw up planning, you screwed up the whole year. Mm -hmm. So um, we try to be as careful as we can about um, getting the planner. First of all, that it's in tip top shape before we start planning. Um, Normally, I actually have their dealer go through a lot and uh, find things. So he usually finds things that I miss. And so um, he goes through and we get all the mechanical parts right. And then when we actually start planting, the first thing we want to make sure the soil is in the right condition. Um, can't go out there and plant too wet. Um, you don't want to have too many weeds, uh, too much uh, residue in the wrong spots. So that's part of it. And then we, you know, getting the seed the right depth, the right spacing. And so uh, we try to pay a lot of attention to that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I guess, you know, you mentioned the, the mechanical side of that. How, how much does getting uh, that, that mechanization figured out early on in the process really impact how you're able to do that over the entire course of your, your planting operations? Oh, we found if, if, if we don't do a good job before we start planting, all we're doing all year long is fixing. And so we spend a little bit more money. Usually Um, we repair parts that look like they might fail. Um, Anything that's close, we go ahead and replace Um, certain items are on a schedule. You know, every two years, these discs get replaced. Every two years, this gets replaced Um, no matter what, because we just see a better job of it. Um, So that's the base planner. And then um, we've also done, like every other farmer, I think, I don't think there's a base planner out in the field. Everybody makes neural modifications <laughs> to planners. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what are your biggest challenges uh, when it comes to the planting season? It sounds like you're trying to prevent some of those challenges yeah. with these things, right. but what do you run into? The biggest, biggest challenge we have is, especially in a wet spring, um, finding the fields that are ready to plant. Um, and so sometimes uh, we'll be planting along and we'll get rained out. Well, the seed we have in the planter doesn't fit the field that the next field that's ready. So you either you switch hybrids or you empty boxes and reload boxes 
Um, and that's, you have to be somewhat flexible because um, conditions change. Uh, you get a rain event, uh, um, or snow event, and you have to be able to move and start planting somewhere else and not try to finish a field up just because you started it because that field isn't ready. Sure. And so I think you- that's probably our biggest challenge is just making, you know, trying to keep what our plan is, is we have, we plan out where all of our hybrids are going to go. And uh, um, like anything else, once you get into the season, the plan doesn't always come to fruition. You know, yeah. you have to be somewhat flexible and willing to make some changes. So do you, do you go about like setting a backup plan for fields as far as like, you know, knowing what you can afford to do? And I mean, how do you kind of hedge your bets against some of these things that can happen to you and get you pushed back a little bit? Oh, don't really make a backup plan per se, more or less. But, oh, I've been doing this a long time. Yeah. Uh, this will be my 42nd crop I'm putting in right now. Wow. So mm-hmm. I've, I've had a little bit of experience on uh, things and <laughs> probably um, most of the ground we farm, we farm for at least 25 years. Um, you know, some of it mm-hmm. has been in the family forever, but we've rented some ground. We've had some ground we've rented for over 40 years. Mm-hmm. So sure. um we've got experience in the ground. We know what works in that field just from uh, past history. Yep. <laughs> got you. What technologies have you implemented in your operation or data that you're collecting that can help overcome some of these challenges? Uh, we collect a lot of information and technology. Um, we've been starting with my dad that we were always an early adopter of technology. Um, way before your time, you youngsters, <laughs> uh, we bought uh, from Hineker um, uh, monitors that we could actually regulate how much anhydrous ammonia was applied. This is clear back oh. in the uh, 1980s, 1990s. Hmm. And so um, dad was a firm believer of that. And we always tried to keep up with new technology. Uh, we were early adopters of ridge planning. Currently, um, and this last year we renovated our planner uh, we have a case planner stack full planner it's about six years old but we um, added the ag leader hydraulic up down pressure and electric seed drives to that mm-hmm. and uh, got rid of a lot of equipment a lot of headaches and that that was a little nervous when we first went to the field with all <laughs> this new stuff um, i have a full-time employee and he does the planting and he was like, you've got to be here because I'm not sure how all this stuff's supposed to work. <laughs> um, he had actually had a hip replaced. And so he was not able to work with me re- renovating the planter. He was on sick leave. And mm-hmm. so I did all the planter work while he was uh, not able to help. And so he's like, help. <laughs> 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 and it worked pretty flawlessly. We were very, very impressed. Awesome. So... I guess in addition to that, you can talk about any other technologies you want to, but I, I'm really interested in how you decide to bring on a technology. Like how, how did you decide that you wanted to go put this hydraulic down for us? I mean, is it mm-hmm. research? Is it just investigation? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Do a lot of research um, and look at studies, both the university studies as well as industry studies and uh, talk with neighbors. And I think to me, this hydraulic down pressure and in our case, actually, a lot of it's uplift, um, probably has the potential of being a, one of the easiest paybacks of technology. Um, and we did a study in 2020, and we're going to repeat it in 2021 as part of the on-farm research using this technology. But uh, we discovered that we were actually putting way more down pressure on the rows with the old technology with our airbags we had before than what is needed mm-hmm. and in dry soil that's not an issue but when you get to wet soils you're going to get some compaction you're going to get uh, some maybe smearing of the seed trench uh, you're going to have some root pruning because of that and i think the payback for the that technology is going to be pretty easy to come up with some of the other so, technologies we do probably is a little harder to get a payback on yeah. um but there's also a lot of creature comforts. Um, we've had auto steering for 
10 years and uh it's a lot easier to farm honestly mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's actually fun to do now <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and diving into that study a little bit more with the downforce i if i remember correctly the yield just in this one year wasn't as black and white as you would think of, yes, this should be adopted. Can you talk about, mm -hmm. you know, you talked about some of these things that you're looking for, but how else are you evaluating some of these technologies, even if they don't show a return, maybe that first year? Well, first of all, I think you have to do several years of studies because we all know every year is different. And mm -hmm. this field we did the study in last year actually was um, in pretty dry. And so I don't think we had the compaction issues. We had some other fields that was not part of the study that are wet, and we definitely saw a difference mm -hmm. in those fields um, by able to basically felt like we we're floating the planter across some uh, fairly wet fields. And so I think it's just, and you know, who knows what this spring is going to bring. That's why we <laughs> replicate our trials um, too. Otherwise, I, um, I think we actually had a better stand and it was, it's hard to compare because it's comparing years, but looking at the stands we've had and for the old system compared to this system, we had a better stand this year. Um, more even to uh, mm -hmm. stand, even though the, the actual planning units hadn't changed, but having electric motors on it and having the correct down pressure, I think we actually ended up with a better stand. Sure. And some of that you don't really see on a study because I didn't just renovate half the planter. I just, you know, did the mm -hmm. whole thing. Yeah. It's, that's really interesting. And, you know, that even seating depth, I guess, is probably a really, really big impact on that even stand then. Mm -hmm. It was. Yeah. And then so, the other part of that study, they also did a speed trial. Um, and this was not my idea. This was the idea of Ag Leader. Um, mm -hmm. And to their opinion, they have seen with the hydraulic down pressure and the electric seed drives, electric motors, uh -huh. that you could actually plant at a higher speed and still maintain good um, space, seed spacing and depth. And it did show that the, we went up to, we had five, seven and 10 mile an hour uh, passes. And the seven mile an hour performed, actually yielded a little better than the five. We don't know why. Um, <laughs> But it's the stand was very similar. The ten mile an hour was definitely too fast. We were leaving seeds on the top of the ground, and uh, and and they knew it was too fast. But yeah. they wanted to have one at the end showing that yes, there is a limit to how fast you can go with a stock planter. Sure, hmm. sure. Do you think that? Do you think any of that has to do with the fact that the planter itself is not necessarily specialized for high speed planting? Or, right. Yeah. yeah. This this okay. is a, not a specialized high speed planter. Um, okay. This was a stock seed drives, uh, just the meters, and then we had the yeah. electric drives on top of it. So we're going to repeat that this year, except we're going to back that ten off to nine. Okay. And just kind of uh, figure out where that limit really is. Figure out where that limit is, yeah. but. Um, as a result, we actually did plant the rest of our crops at a higher speed than we normally do because we could tell when we were planting and doing, we were digging up seeds and stuff and the spacing and the depth at seven was just as good as it was at five, which shocked us because that never was the case before. Hmm. Huh. So do you think that's going to be a pretty big impact on your operation long-term realizing that you can do that a little bit faster? I think so. I mean, I, I still, we won't push that too much unless there's a rain cloud coming. And sure. You know, that bottle <laughs> may just get bumped up a little bit, but, but knowing we have that ability. So I think it has an impact. Um, and again, how do you modify it? You know, monetize that? I don't know, but uh, it is a benefit. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can you also talk about some of your other studies? So I think you've been involved <laughs> with some, uh, some the different planting rate. I'm sure you do some hybrid uh, testing. Can you go into some of those? Yeah, I've, I've done a lot uh, with on-farm research. Um, our local extension educator, Sarah Sibbets, I, I keep asking her, is this too many? <laughs> no, no, I'm, this is fun. And so, uh, yeah, we did the two with the egg leader on the planter. We did two other studies this last year using um, fertilizer. Um, Nutrien has a more available phosphorus fertilizer than 1034O, and so we're doing a three-year study on that using the same strips with the same fertilizers for three years in a row or soil testing each strip trying mm -hmm. to find out what it's doing with the soils as well as what the yields do 
Um, their, their claim is that you need to use one third as many gallons. So if your normal fertilizer rate would be 15 gallons of 1034L, you'd only put on five gallons of their product. Hmm. Of course, it costs three times as much. So the, the <laughs> dollars are equal. It's not cost you yeah. more, but they're saying it's more available. And so that's what we're, that's a study. Uh, another study is on manganese. Um, this is from our agronomist. He uh, um, has been reading some literature that he feels that we need to have our soil manganese levels somewhere in the 20 parts per million range. And we're sitting at about seven to eight. Currently, University of Nebraska has no recommendations for manganese. And hmm. so this is, again, a long-term study trying to find out if we add manganese in this, in, at planting time, will it raise the soil levels and will it impact yield? Mm -hmm. um, we just, one year into it, this year was no, no difference so far. Sure. Um, the other study I've been done with uh, Dr. Joe Luck for two years on a soybean population study. Um, one of his, where he has replicated blocks scattered throughout the field. Um, and that has been very interesting to do. We run at um, 80 to 170,000. We went 80, 110, 140, and 170,000 seeds per acre dropped. And uh, the results from the 2020 study showed that we have flat yield. It didn't matter what we dropped pop, uh, seed at, we had the same exact yield. And we had two different varieties of soybeans in that study, and, it, and they both were the same. It didn't matter huh. what hmm. seed you dropped. Um, and that actually started two years ago. We had a field that we had some crusting on, and we actually had our plants were somewhere in the 60,000 plants per acre was all we had survive. And, but it was even spacing, and so the agronomist and I decided, well, let's leave it, see what happens. <laughs> And at harvest, when we were getting to those thin spots, I was looking at the combine monitor, it was still yielding over 75 bushels the acre oh. with very low population. So it's like, how low can we go? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's why we started the study with, with Dr. Luck. And, uh, and it's been very interesting. Uh, soybeans will uh, definitely recoup a lot more. Yeah. I would say that range then, might be more than what some people are comfortable with. How did you handle like taking that risk? Yeah. Oh, I, to me, it wasn't that big of a risk since I'd seen it accidentally the first year. I knew what beans to do. And I actually actually pushed Dr. Luck to go a little lower than 80,000 and he didn't want to go there. Um, I thought, let's go to 60. Let's try it down there. Well, he didn't want to go that low. And so uh, we went to 80 and it was kind of fun because um, seed dealers and agronomists and stuff have been out in my fields. They, they come out and look, walk around with me. And we get to those plots where there's only 80,000 dropped and the stems, the sleevings are huge. Um, and we discovered there's a lot less lodging. They don't blow over because their their stems are you know twice, maybe three times the diameter of a normal soybean stem. Hmm. Yeah. And it's not uncommon to find a plant with 200, 250 pods on it per plant. Hmm. <laughs> it just branches out and it fills the space up that it has. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very comfortable. We've we've been planting everything at 120,000. Uh, we may drop to 110,000 this year. Um, everybody's happy about it except the seed dealers. They don't like it. So <laughs> don't like their seed. Um, and we've had good weed control, so that's not been an issue. That's good too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you come up with the ideas for what exactly it is that you want to study? I mean, I, we, you know, here it was like kind of an accidental deal, right? That you came across in the field, but how do you come up with like the technology you want to test? Um, there's a lot of ways. Um, I, I, tend to be fairly active in social media and uh, a lot on Twitter and Facebook, but a lot of Twitter friends across the country and across the world uh, that are involved in ag. And there, there's different ideas. There's some, I have a lot of friends who think outside the box and we have a lot of conversations and it's like, well, what would happen when we do X, Y, or Z or mm -hmm. something like that? Um, same thing with my agronomist. We sit down in the winter and usually have spend an afternoon just talking about where can we make a change? How can we how can we get same yield with less inputs or increase our yield with the same input? You know, how do we get better? As well as we're always trying to keep improving our soil. 
Um, you know, we're, we're not trying to mine the soil. We're trying to always leave it better than it was the year before. So a lot of us just talking to people um, and some people come up with ideas, but they don't want to try them. Hey, let's try them. Um, I'm always game for a good experiment. Um, we've got a couple of new ones we're going to try this year. Um, one's in the works now. We're doing a cover crop. Um, my, my local agronomist, he was, always likes wheat for a cover crop, hmm. whereas the university and many others want cereal rye. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so we have a cereal rye and wheat in, in strips and wheat in strips. And we're going to do that, see how much growth we get, how much yield we'll have on the corn crop following, et cetera. So cool. we'll see. Can I also ask, uh, you're doing all these studies and some people may not be willing to test it on their own farm. How are you, like, I just love how you're willing to share this. I mean, you talk about how you're active on social media, you're active on the on-farm research network. Why is that such an important thing to you to share what you're finding out on your operation? That's a great question. Um, I think it's partially is that I don't think any one of us know all the answers. And also, I can share what half works on my farm, and it may not work on someone in Illinois' farm, but it may give them an idea how to do something different on their farm. And honestly, it's um, anything we can do as an industry to continue to increase our yields and continue to decrease how much inputs we have to use to grit those yields, that's a good thing. And so I'm all for um, helping out and doing research. And I'm working with the on-farm research at university. It's been great because um, being able to be, have contact with the extension educators, um, crop specialists, um, they have a lot of expertise to add and they do a lot of the statistical analysis that I won't do, quite frankly. <laughs> I look at it, I go back, go nuts. And I know it's red since you do that a lot. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'm glad that they're willing to do the analysis to find out whether it actually was a true result or if it was just accidental, which is why I like using the on farm research. But yeah, I, I have, um, I've told other people that I don't have any secrets in the farm. I really I don't. Um, if you want to know what I'm doing, fine, you can come visit me and we'll talk about it. But, you know, I know I've been on other farms. I know that what works here won't work up in Northeast Nebraska, or won't work in Southwest Nebraska. Uh, we have different climates, different soils. Mm -hmm. And even from where I live to just, just across the what we farm, we have to farm different places differently because the soils are so different. Yeah. And so you have to know what works on, on each piece. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, you, I mean, you've talked about these studies, right? And there's a lot of data that goes into these studies, but I assume you're also collecting data just on your general planting operation and, you know, how you're doing there. I mean, how do you go about evaluating that? It's a, it's a lot to, to really take in. It is. And, and um, you can delve into the numbers as much as you want. Um, I do own um, SMS advanced. And so any of the, all the data that we collect out of the planter through the monitors, goes in and we look at, you know, was, were we getting the population that we wanted? Um, were we getting the, you know, and also we go, did we get the right seed in the right place? Did we get the right population on? Um, did we get the, the fertilizer on we were supposed to? Cause we do put some fertilizer on with the planter. Um, and then there is a lot of just digging on the soil too, just checking out, did it work? Um, yeah. Did we get stands? so forth yeah and i don't know analyzing it it's, i don't know how you analyze except you just kind of look to see what you've got done and what what worked and sure what didn't. sure I, I guess one so th this just popped in my head as you were talking have you ever come across any point in time where you've been able to identify like a machine failure or anything like that that happened by looking at, at some of that data i don't know I, I i feel like i saw something in one field this past year we were doing research on where we saw a compaction spot and i was able to you know notice it with the planting data that the uh, population hmm. just wasn't up to snuff because i guess they weren't able to, you know plant effectively into it but hmm. uh, we've i've definitely found spots where we've had um like starter fertilizer 
pump quit or we didn't get that on. And by then we were able to go in and um, recover that with doing some side dress fertilizer. We could rep replicate or put back what should have been a planting time. We've had a couple of those instances where we saw we had a mechanical failure. Um, some cases the operator knows it and in some cases it doesn't, you know, things, yeah. things happen. And um, so that's why we do collect the data and, and look at it. But honestly, we've had a lot less failures uh, with, with advanced electronics. Now, you know what's going on on the cab. Um, mm -hmm. Where um, back when I first started planning, you know, planner had a chain drive on, each row had its own chain drive. And if a chain fell off, you wouldn't know it. You went back to fill up a seat. Yeah, yeah. And so then you'd have to go back and replant all of that mm. because you didn't know when you quit planting seed. Um, right. Technology is, um, like I say, it's it's come a long ways. It's some ways it's made things easier, and some ways it's made things harder. <laughs> because there's nothing worse than sitting on a beautiful sunny spring day. And you're not in the field because you got a wire broke on that planter somewhere mm. and you yeah. can't find yeah. it and you can't do a thing until you find that wire. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, yeah. That's, that's a pain. <laughs> that's a pain. And that's happened. Um, you just one little wire somewhere that's broke and the whole planter shuts down and you can't do anything until you mm. find the short and fix it. Going back to a little bit of like the softwares that you use, or mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about how you go about making planting prescriptions or what kind of data you use to inform those prescriptions? Sure. Um, like I said, we use SMS um, and uh, we've been collecting yield data since 2007. And so I have quite a uh, history of yield data we use. And so using, um, and again, I, part of this is from being taught by the university, um, but we clean the data up and uh, do a multi-year analysis over the harvest data. And then we cluster the uh, results. And so our typical will have three to four population ranges in a field um, based on the past history of yields mm -hmm. and um, the higher yielding areas get more seed and get more fertilizer the low yielding areas get less seed and less fertilizer and so then we develop uh, prescription maps uh, based on that for both seed and fertilizer um, we keep the fertilizer steady uh, flat rate in the spring we strip till as well as planting but then the side dress is when we do the modification of the fertilizer the sure. high yielding areas get more fertilizer and side dress. Sure. So when you, I guess, when you choose to implement this variable rate seeding, I mean, have you found fields that it really pays on and then other fields where, you know, you tried it and maybe it didn't pay on? I mean, we have that fields been? that we don't even, we just flat rate it um, yep. because it just, there's not enough variation in the field. Um, some of our fields have extensive soil types, uh, variations or, um, in some cases it's elevation. We've got, um, some high water tables. And so there's certain parts of the fields that, um, be, just because of the lower part of the field, we sometimes don't even get them planted. If we get it planted, we don't be able to get much growth. So we don't put a lot of, um, you know, fertilizer out, if any, um, and not sure. a lot of seed because we know it's not going to yield much anyhow. Yep. Um, but generally we most of our fields we found that there is, you know, better ground and poor ground. And you can talk to any farmer and they'll tell you where the good ground is. We all know where it is mm -hmm. in our heads yeah. from years of farming it. We know where the good stuff is. Um, but the advantage of the technology is that it allows you to precisely figure that out. And then with variable rate, if it's not going to yield, why put anything out there? Yeah. You know, why put a why put 40,000 seeds or 35,000 seeds to the acre if 20,000 will yield just as much? Cut your seed costs in half, <laughs> cut your fertilizer in half, because um, it's only going to make 130 or 140 bushels. And I've got some ground like that. It doesn't matter what you do, it's not yeah. going to yield. Um, mm -hmm. we've, tried, we've tried different things in the past, and it's just some ground just isn't there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just one more question on that. When you look, so when you look at a management zone layer, 
Like, can you basically say right off the bat whether you say, okay, this is this management zone right here is is accurate, or say like, no, this is not at all matching to what I've seen out there in the field. Yeah, we've had, there are you. Um, that's one thing I've discovered is that after I create the maps using SMS, I go in and and adjust because okay. there's yeah. some areas that I know okay, that's <laughs> that's not that's the there's reason it's low is because we had a wipeout or so or we had a disaster yeah. or something else that was not the soil's fault and so yeah i do go in and adjust fields yeah. um adjust zones um because every and every field we we tweak and adjust just because we know that and then again we you know every hybrid has different populations it wants to be planted at as well and so that's why we do our hybrid plan and then we set the populations up according to the hybrids going in the field because we have some hybrids that don't want to be planted any higher than 30,000 seeds to the acre. We have some hybrids that won't, they, they need to be at 35. Sure. And so um, we develop different pop, or prescriptions based on what's going in there. And then if we have to change the hybrids because of weather or something else, then I have to come back in and rewrite new prescriptions. <laughs> and yeah. uh, that happens. Not fun, but it happens. Sure. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I think we've covered a lot of what you're currently doing, and it sounds like you are really up on what is going on with technology right now. But let's talk a little bit about where you want things to go, or maybe like this wish list. So what planting technologies could be better suited to your operation? Yeah, that's that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> that's a really hard question. Um, I don't know. Um, there are some new stuff that's coming out. Uh, the multi-hybrid planters, mm-hmm. I think that has a place, could have a place on certain places. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to work. Uh, just, I think some of the soil sensing technology um, that possibly is sensing the nutrient levels in the soil as you're planting so that you can develop maps to come back and, and fertilize in the summer or even at mm-hmm. planting time. I think that technology is going to be interesting. And then just going a step beyond what we currently do with auto steer and going to full robotic planting, I mm-hmm. think is the a next step. Um, I, unfortunately, I've been around electronics long enough. I know that no matter how good they are, they also <laughs> fail. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that's the word, that's what reason me about robotics is that mm-hmm. when it fails, you know, will it know it stopped, failed and stopped or, you know, how do you fix that? But I think that's probably some of the new steps coming in on the line is some like the, say, some of the robotics. Yeah. That are coming up. Yeah. That the failure point is interesting, right? Because, you know, since you know, you're going to fail, you have to make sure that that fail safe is at the right spot. You got to, I guess, prioritize what they can't fail on. Right. Right. No yeah. Stop. yeah. It, you know, make sure that it doesn't run out of seed, that it's not putting seed on the top of the ground, and as well as, you know, making sure it stays in the field and things come up, mm-hmm. you know, and um, it happens to all of us. So, absolutely. Some things, some things you just don't see because, uh, you know, if uh, you plug up with trash, put sort of road starts pushing trash because it's not cutting through it, well, that's not going to show up on any monitor. You're just going to see a pile out there. And that's why you have to visually watch from the cab, whereas uh, I'm not sure that a robotic at this point has that capability. Um, yeah. Maybe that's what you're working on. I don't know. <laughs> nah, <laughs> neither of us are working on that, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> we have had, we did have uh, Rachel Stevens in our lab, you know, back a couple of years ago, who was looking at the multi-hybrid thing. So it's interesting to hear you you mention that. And mm-hmm. Well, I actually, I think that's, it, it's, it has potential. Um, I don't know of any, my neighbors don't have any of those yet, but uh, it has potential, I think, um, in certain fields. I'm not sure it's everywhere, but mm-hmm. in certain fields. Yeah, absolutely. So have you seen anything, you, you mentioned you're very, you know, active on social media. Have you seen anything from other people that really has kind of piqued your interest and you're at least thinking about uh, testing out a little bit right now? Uh, probably the, the biggest one is, is all in the range of cover crops and mm-hmm. how to get cover crops in our corn system. Um, we're currently using cover crops after soybeans. 
Um, but our corn harvest is late enough. It's hard to plant anything after corn harvest and get a cover crop to, to work. So there are uh, different ones working on interseeding uh, cover crops, um, split row and maybe a wide row of corn and with cover crops in between. In fact, I was just having a conversation, a neighbor this morning who started doing some interseeding this last year. Hmm. And uh, so we'll see what's going on. And uh, see, base is a way of getting cover crops growing inside the corn stand without having uh, two problems, not, not hurting the corn yield yeah. as well as still um, getting some of the cover crop benefits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thinking along those lines of the cover crops or even earlier, were you talking about finding the right field with the right moisture that you can go out to? What mm -hmm. about sensors out in the field that are there out at planting already in the soil? Have you explored anything along those lines or is that something you would like to see? Yeah, currently our, um, we do is use soil moistures, but they go, usually are put in, you know, midsummer. Right. Um, yeah. And I've, I've talked to the dealers about trying to get them out earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be, I think it would be helpful to have, because uh, we use them for irrigation. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason we use soil moistures, monitors. Sure. Um, but, but yeah, there's a fair amount of, you just got to drive around and look at the fields and walk them <laughs> yeah. and go out and dig with a shovel and well, should we go here yet or not? And, yep. <laughs> you can't get around true ground truth, right? <laughs> no, you still have to have that sense of going out and checking on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So are there any technologies? I know we've, we've talked about the downforce being a really, you know, huge benefit for your operation, um, mm -hmm. but are there technologies that you would also recommend to other growers at least give a shot on their farm? Well, I hate to, you know, um, two way things. I think first of all, a yield monitor is, is essential. Um, you need to be able to measure what we're doing and mm -hmm. having a yield monitor is the first step. Um, the other thing that to me is a, it pays as well as it's good for the environment is some type of monitor on both fertilizer and sprayers to regulate how much we're putting on. Um, we, you need to know, you know, for example, on our sprayer, you know, set, you know, mix your tanks up right. And then if you're putting on 20 gallons the acre, put on 20 gallons the acre, don't put on 15 or don't put on 25. Yeah. Um, same with fertilizer. You need to be able to measure what you're putting on and put the right amount on. Um, I think that those those uh, monitors we've had in our operation a long time, and they paid very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, just a matter of uh, getting the right amount of product on the field, both herbicide and fertilizer. And yep. I wouldn't go without one. Um, <laughs> I really wouldn't. Yeah. So awesome. that to me, that's a kind of an entry point. Um, and then once you get into planning, um, then there's there's. You know, and there's more technologies out there I know that I'm not doing from other companies. Um, but then it's a matter of what your price point is and what you're comfortable mm -hmm. with. Um, and it's hard. It, it takes a while you know, to make them pay. Um, yeah. And that's, that's my whole thing is to try to um, use that harvest data that we've been collecting since 2007 and, and uh, make it pay in our operation. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So building on that, do you have another piece of advice? That was great. You know, some advice there, but if you had one piece of advice planting or otherwise to offer to our listeners, what would that be? Um, to make sure you plant your crops, you know, spend the time to get your plant or crops planted correctly. Um, if you don't get them planted right, you're always fighting at the rest of the season. So you know, if it's going to take, you got to wait another day before you get the corn planted on the field, wait an extra day, you'll be much further ahead. Um, and so often it's just patience. It's just you have to be able to wait. And then when it's right, then you can go like crazy. But <laughs> wait, yeah. wait, wait until the field is ready. And uh, because if you get into a hurry, you'll, you'll cause all kinds of problems that may have impact your field for several years. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I know this because I've learned it the hard way because <laughs> I've got into a big of a hurry and I've, I've done the mistakes. And uh, that's one of the advantages that I guess being old has. I, I've been around the farm a couple of times. 
<laughs> there you go. Thank you to Don for spending some time with us to discuss his planting operation and technology. It's always great to hear from farmers actually putting these technologies to work versus just the testing side that we typically see <laughs> as graduate students. And so with that, you know, my favorite part was actually hearing about some of those things he's running, but those results and hearing about how excited he is about a lot of those things he's testing out. Yeah, it's cool. He's able to actually put some things into practice and, and test how they work on his farm. Because, you know, as he stated several times, he believes that what works on your ground is almost particularly your ground and has to be tweaked just about anywhere else. Um, mm -hmm. But on the flip side of that coin, I also enjoyed hearing about how Don actually gets his ideas of new things to look at um, and how he cultivates his vision for where he wants his operation to go in the future. You know, he said he's very active on social media and, and actually, you know, talks to some friends that he has both here in Nebraska and in the nation, but also internationally. Um, and he gets some of those ideas. So, you know, it's so interesting how even though things are particular to his operation, he can still pull ideas from other folks that are doing cool things. That was interesting. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining us for this first episode of the Farm Bits podcast within the planting technology series. We look forward to you joining us next week as we take a deeper dive into the tech advancements that are pushing planting operations forward with our next guest, Rachel Stevens. Thank you for taking the time to join us today on the Farm Bits podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts to be informed about the latest content each week. We welcome your feedback. So if you have comments or questions for us, please reach out to us over email, on Twitter, or in the review section of your favorite podcast platform. Our contact information can also be found in the show notes. We would like to thank Nebraska Extension for their support of this podcast and their commitment to providing high quality informational material to members of the agricultural community in Nebraska and beyond. The opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on this podcast are solely their own and do not reflect the views of Nebraska Extension or the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. We look forward to you joining us next week for another episode of Farm Bits.